Hello friends, this is Paul, and I hope you're enjoying wandering through nature with me each week. Well, if you enjoy wandering through nature and you enjoy journaling those wanderings, in other words, writing down or drawing whatever you find out there on our adventures, well, I've got an awesome nature journal for you. Yeah, I have three different nature journals with three different covers on them. The insides are pretty much the same. Lots of blank pages for you to write and draw all your experiences and your feelings while you're wandering through nature. The covers are different on each one of the three. And I also, for the young at heart or the youngsters who wander through nature with you, I have a children's nature journal, which is a guided nature journal. Lots of pages filled with ideas and suggestions for adventures in nature. Maybe they want to go exploring nature at night, doing a bug night. Well, they can do that with my suggestions and they can write everything down in their journal. And of course, I did leave some pages blank for the youngsters to actually fill them out. Where can you get these awesome journals? Well, they're available now on Amazon. Yeah, Amazon.com. Do a search for author Paul Ferringer, and you'll find the Nature Wander journals. And I'm in the middle of creating some new ones, so keep an eye out and grab those journals while they're available. Have a great day, and keep wandering through nature. Hello friends, I'm Paul, and yes, that means this is the Nature Wanderer podcast. I'd like to thank you for joining me in the wilds of my backyard today. And I always find that to be kind of a strange term, my backyard. It's, if you knew my house, I actually have an earth-bermed house, so it's got dirt on three sides of the house, and creating kind of like a, a basement effect. It keeps it warmer in the winter time, and it keeps it cooler in the summer. So it saves energy. I have a very energy efficient house, but it doesn't face the road. My house is about 400 feet back on my property, away from the road, and it actually faces south. I have a north-south running road that I live on. So if I faced it towards the road, the front of the house would be facing east. It's just hearing some birds, so I'll stop a second. Yeah, I don't know if you can hear them. There's a, a crow, ca crow calling. I believe it's a crow. A little deep. Might be a raven, but... Uh, anyhow, so my f house would be... If it was facing the road, it would be facing east. And I didn't want to do that because I wanted the front of my house facing south to get the warmth from the sun. Like I said, energy efficient. It was built so that it could be energy efficient, including getting that solar radiation coming in in the winter time when the sun is higher, or sorry, lower on the horizon, and it can beat right into the windows warming my house up. And then in the summertime, when it's warm, the sun is higher on the horizon, and so it doesn't beat into the windows as much. But that's the way my house is. So when I say my backyard, I'm actually out in, I don't know, the side of my house. So the side of my house is facing east and, or west, sorry, and that's where my, what I consider my backyard is. I'm in my side yard, backyard, I always consider it my backyard. And the reason that I'm out here in my backyard is I want to let you know a little bit about the great backyard bird count. Now that term is used loosely. You can bird or participate. I'm actually hearing some birds right now, so I stopped. Um, but you can participate in the Great Backyard Bird Count, not just from your backyard, but anywhere. A local park, you can go to um, a 
nature center, you can go to a county park, you can go to a state park, you can go to a uh, rails to trails trail. You can go wherever you want to do this birding. You can do it at work. If you're at work on Friday, um, you can sit there and watch out your window during your lunch break and count the birds. So the great backyard bird count is what I want to talk about today. What is the great backyard bird count? Well, the great backyard bird count is part of citizen science. I know I've talked to you about citizen science in the past and what citizen science is all about. Citizen science, for those of you who haven't heard me talk about it before, if you haven't, start listening to the past episodes. They're awesome. Um, but citizen science is essentially... And I've said this before, citizen or scientists, sorry, scientists cannot be everywhere. So where are they? They're out there in the field doing the research. They are in um, the lab, putting the research together, all the data together. Um, but there aren't scientists everywhere. They're not in my backyard. <laughs> no, scientists don't come to my yard to count the birds. So they need help to get as much data as they can. So they depend on citizens, people like you and I, the average everyday person, um, to collect data for them. They train them, really easy online training, and then they ask them, hey, get outside and collect data for us. And with the great backyard bird count, I have Rivia with me, she's nudging my arm here because she wants me to rub her head. But the great backyard bird count is collecting data about birds. And I do bird counts throughout the year. Uh, I'm watching some birds flying over here. And it looks like chickadees. Okay, I think I got like seven chickadees, but anyhow, the we collect data on birds. I do the Christmas bird count. I do the great backyard bird count. Um, I, I do some other bird counts as well, some casual bird counts, some formal bird counts. But this is one of my favorites, the great backyard bird count. Very easy to participate, very easy to do. I'm going to talk a little bit about how to do it and how to participate, uh, just to let you know how easy it is. Now, the great backyard bird count always takes place, I believe it's the second weekend of February, uh, maybe the third, but it's always the same weekend every year. This year, this backyard bird count is actually this coming weekend, which is why I'm talking about it today. I didn't want to record it on or during the great backyard bird count because then it would be released next Thursday and you would have missed it. And I want you to get out and enjoy this too. So I'm recording this beforehand. So even though I'm counting birds today, it's not going to count towards the Great Backyard Bird Count. It's just going on my eBird log, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. But this weekend, February 16th through the 19th, that's not just the weekend. It's the extended weekend. So it starts on Friday. If you're listening to this on the day of release, which is the 15th, um, it starts tomorrow. And it goes right through to Monday. So you can count birds Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, and you're probably like, I got plans this week, and I don't have time for that. It doesn't take much time. It only takes 15 minutes. You know, it can take longer. You can put in as much time as you want, but it's a minimum of 15 minutes. So how do you do this? Well, first of all, pick a place to count the birds, a place where you want to go, whether it's your own backyard, whether you want to just sit inside because it's not the greatest weather, it's too cold, and you're one of those people who thinks that people actually hibernate in the winter. We're not supposed to. Get out and enjoy nature. But you can just sit inside, watch your bird feeders. You can go out for a hike. You can just sit outside and watch the birds. Uh, you, there's so many ways that you can participate in the count. But pick a place. Pick where you want to go. It can be more than one place. In the same day, you can, you know, go to a park and then you come home in the evening, see all the birds, your bird feeders, and you start counting them. I mean, I've done that before where I actually went out somewhere, counted birds, and I came home, 
counted birds at my bird feeder. And then later on in the evening, um, before the sun went down, I noticed some birds hanging out at my bird feeders. I counted those. So just take, you know, a location or locations. You can do different locations each day, too. So choose a location. That's the first step. Second step for this. You watch the birds. 15 minutes minimum. So I didn't say just 15 minutes. I said minimum. You can count the birds for 15 minutes or more. Try to count them as long as you want. Um, the longer, the better, the more data you get. So count them for at least 15 minutes, at least once over the four days. So like I said, February 16th through the 19th, once during those four days. If you want to count them more than that, you want to count every day, several times a day, that's great. Once again, the more data, the better. And it's also great for you because you're out there in nature, exploring nature, relaxing nature. I mean, it's so many benefits to watching the birds. So that's step two. Watch the birds at least 15 minutes at your location. Step three, identify all the birds that you see or hear. I just heard a chickadee in the woods. Um, identify all the birds that you see or hear within your planned time and location. And then use one of the tools to record them. What do I mean by one of the tools? Well, there's different ways to record the birds that you are hearing or seeing. My favorite, which is what I do, is I use eBird. And I also use Merlin Bird ID. Uh, go back to my episode on nature apps and I talk a little bit more about these. But in brief, go on to um, your Play Store or wherever you get your apps downloaded from and put in Merlin Bird ID. And it's going to come up with the Merlin app. Now, the Merlin app was put out by Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And for those who don't know, ornithology means birds. So these are the guys who know they're birds. They put this app out, which you can start it by doing a sound recording. It will identify what birds you're hearing. It's, it works great. I love the app. Um, it also has an area where it will identify birds by sight. You just have to put the identification or the information that you have on the bird into the app. And it will identify the bird for you. Uh, another... <laughs> That's Rivia. She's nice and muddy right now. But um, Another app I use a lot while I'm doing the backyard bird count is eBird. So if you don't have it yet, download it. It's a lot of fun to use. You use eBird to record what birds you've seen. And it keeps track of your distance. So if you're doing a hike, it'll keep track of your distance, how long you were birding. So you can keep an eye on the ticker and say, oh, it hasn't been 15 minutes yet. So you can keep going longer or maybe you went a real long time and you want to record how long you've been out. Well, eBird does that. And if you use either eBird um, or Merlin, all the data during this weekend goes right to the people who need it, the lab. And they will take that information and they'll put it in their database. So it's very easy. Now, if you're not tech savvy, okay, another way to do it is to go on to their website, which I'll put the link for the Great Backyard Bird Count. I will put that in the show notes. Okay, I promise I'll be in there. If you go to the website for the Great Backyard Bird Count, you just put in um, birdcount.org, or you can do a Google search for, you know, Great Backyard Bird Count, or GBBC is sometimes how it's called, and they will have uh, downloadable forms. So you can fill out these forms, um, send them in. They really don't want you to do that because that's a lot of, you know, time taken away from their scientists uh, from entering data. Or give it to a friend who is tech savvy. They'll put it in. If you live in my neighborhood, you know, drop it off to me. I'll be more than happy to put it in for you. Uh, all about doing citizen science. Why do this? 
You know, why participate in the Great Backyard Bird Count? Like I said, citizen science. So we are going to help the scientists by counting the birds. They use that data to see how the bird populations are doing. There, I, I've been reading reports lately about how we've lost probably about a third of all birds in the world. I mean, populations are plummeting, especially field species. Uh, fields are not the way they used to be. They're being farmed. They're, um, you know, for our food. Or, well, I'm not going to get into the soapbox here, but species are declining. And they know this because of citizen science, because of other research they've been doing. Uh, so all this research, this data, helps them to figure out how birds are doing. So that's one of the reasons to do it. But the other reason, which I think is just as important, it gets you out of nature. It's fun. It's exciting. I love just sitting there watching, listening. I'm hearing some crows. So I gotta record them. But it gets them gets you out in nature. You can watch the birds. You know how therapeutic it is to watch the birds? I mean, it's relaxing. I love watching the birds. Love listening to the birds. Um, it, it's just so relaxing to be out here in nature and watching and listening to them. Uh, best time to go birding, just real quick, because I'm not at the best time. <laughs> it's the afternoon. Yeah, it's the eh, mid-afternoon, late afternoon right now where I am, and so not the best time to go birding. I am seeing some birds, I am hearing some birds, but even my bird feeders are pretty quiet right now. And I keep my bird feeders filled, so it's not because they're empty. Please, if you have bird feeders, fill up. The birds, especially in the winter time, they depend on that food. But oh, there goes a crow flying over. Awesome. Um, but yeah, while well, you're Another crow calling. So they're going to be recorded for, even though it's not the Great Backyard Bird Count the, right now, um, I'm going to record them on my eBird anyhow. So it gets you out of nature. You can, you know, enjoy it. So it's relaxing. I'm really enjoying being out here today. Uh, it's a beautiful day. Uh, very cloudy, a little foggy because it warmed up a bit. Snow's melting. Uh, but anyhow, well, that's why you should be out. I'm hearing the. I'm hearing some dark-eyed juncos now too. So I'm hearing a lot of different birds. But the best time, early morning. Yeah, early morning is the best time to come out. That's when the birds have woken up and they're out there looking for food, gathering food. Um, and then they, you know, start heading to, to the woods to, you know, get away from any danger. So that's why you do it. Um, like I said, there's been about a 30% population decline since 1970 in the U.S. and Canada. Uh, that's about 2.9 billion, with a B, billion birds that have disappeared. Um, scientists are still trying to figure out why, but I mean, there's a lot of things that they have found already, like climate change, of course, and it's also because of human encroachment, development, uh, they're losing their habitats. Now, according to Cornell, Lab of Ornithology, once again, the bird experts, as I call them, um, there's about 11,000 species of birds in the world. I mean, these are fascinating animals, birds. I, I love watching birds. I used to hate them when I was a kid. Or I shouldn't say I hated them. I just didn't have any interest in birds when I was younger. Uh, but for some reason, it just caught on. I just started watching birds and it just stuck. Now I'm, you know addicted to watching birds. I, I love watching them, but um, there's about 11,000 species in the world, according to Cornell. 
That's about 251 families of birds. Now some sources say there's more and I've read some sources that say that there's less than this as well. So um, it, there's a lot of varying information. I trust Cornell though. They do, and that's what they're all about is birds. They do a lot of research, they gather a lot of data, and so they um, have good numbers in my opinion. Maybe you don't trust them, maybe you have other sources, but yeah, I've heard different sources say different things. Uh, but birds, fascinating animals. Did you know that birds are the only animals that have feathers? Which feathers are pretty cool. I mean, they're waterproof. They're great insulation. Now, if you take a feather and you put it underwater and then you lift it out, the water's just going to drip off and they're dry. I mean, they are waterproof, the feathers. They help to keep the bird dry. Uh, I've seen some birds that they look like a drowned rat in the rain, but then they just shake themselves and they're all fluffed up again. Yeah, so they're all nice and nice and dry just by shaking. So waterproof feathers. Now the feathers also keep them warm. You may think, well, that feather is really thin. Wouldn't fur be better? Well, fur weighs a lot. Feathers are lighter weight. And remember, this is a bird. They have to get off the ground. So the feathers are very lightweight and they also link together. So the barbules, the way the feather spines are, um, they actually clip together and they link together. So they act as a better insulation for the bird. Fur, and they've done a lot of studies about this, fur is not as good an insulation as feathers are. I would have thought the opposite, but you know, feathers are better insulation. They're also lighter weight than fur. So that's why birds have feathers. They have to get off the ground. They have to be lightweight. Another thing that helps them get off the ground, hollow bones. Yeah, birds have hollow bones. Makes them more lightweight. So they don't have marrow inside their bones. That would make them too heavy. Now, I'm talking about how birds fly. Well, before I get too deep in here and someone starts sending me messages and saying, well, not all birds. Yes, that is true. Not all birds fly. Okay. Most birds do. But there are some species of birds that do not fly. For instance, the um, penguin and the ostrich, they don't fly. There's actually a bird that doesn't have wings. Anyone know who that is? I'll give you a second to think about it. Don't do a Google search. No. The kiwi in Australia. Yeah, the kiwi bird is actually wingless. So obviously without wings, they're not flying. But it is a bird. It has feathers. It has all the other attributes of a bird. It just doesn't fly. But penguins, no. They don't fly. They do have wings. Really short, stubbly wings that help them glide through the water. But the penguin, yo, know, yeah, penguins, great swimmers. Should have been fish, but no, they are birds. They have feathers. And the ostriches are another bird that cannot fly, but they got long legs and they can run pretty darn quick. Now, another interesting thing about birds is the way they attract their mates. It's like some other animals where they have to do a courtship. Where, But with birds, it's all about the color and the song. Yeah, bright colors attracts a female. With birds, usually, not always. Some birds, male and female, look the same, but with most birds, the male is more colorful, brighter in colors. The female, she's dull in color. So it's the male who's trying to prove himself, make himself look really good, like, yeah, you want me, not the other ones. And the way they do that is by having bright colors. Now, the interesting thing is, what you're seeing and what the female bird is seeing on this male bird are totally different. Yeah, they can see the bright colors, but they're seeing something different too. They're seeing colors on that male that we don't see. So you may think, well, all four of those male cardinals look exactly the same. So why doesn't the female go to that one instead of that one? Well, the reason is because of the ultraviolet colors. Birds can see in the ultraviolet. So there's a little slight change between each of the birds, the males, with the ultraviolet glow on them. The one who has the most probably gets the most females. So that's one way is the color, but also the song. Yeah, they gotta sing a beautiful song 
where the female's going to be like, eh, maybe not this guy. But So those are how they attract the, ma the females, the mates. Now, there are some birds down in South America and some other places too, but they also do quite a display. Yeah, the males will do a dance of some sort or some other display, and that'll help them to attract a mate. Actually, I had a chance when I was doing my bird bander training up at Braddock Bay, um, up by Rochester, New York. Um, I took some training up there to learn how to bird band and eventually did get my own master permit for, or master license for bird banding. Um, so I'm a licensed bird bander. But during my training, we had some researchers from Cornell that would come in and they're doing different studies on the birds. One guy was actually recording the night songs of birds and they did it here because it's right on the lake and the birds were coming from Canada during the winter and heading over the lake and, um, and then in the, in the springtime they were coming up from the southern states and they'd stop and Braddock Bay, take a break before they had to go across the lake. So, so they were hitting them, well, they were basically getting large numbers of birds spring and fall. And that's why these researchers would go to Braddock Bay. The whole reason was because lots of birds to study. And one researcher was studying the how birds call, the night calls of some birds. Apparently, some birds will chickadee I'm hearing. Um, some birds would do a night call and another researcher came in the one time. Oh, there's the chickadee. I see him. Another researcher came in the one time and he was just starting some studies on how birds see in the ultraviolet. And he had a whole setup. His, and essentially when I was there, his entire first year was going to be figuring out the best setup to record his data. And so he had all these specialized cages for the birds. So after we would catch them in the net, band them, um, he would take them, put them into the special cage, and he would uh, put them under certain lighting conditions, you know, UV lights. And so he could see the ultraviolet. So I got a chance to see what they look like under the ultraviolet light. And now that I do bird banding, uh, one of the ways that we age a saw-wet owl when I do my saw-wet owl banding is we have a black light and a UV black light and we hold the wing under the light and you can actually see some reddish color on it. And depending on which feathers are glowing or not, you can actually age the bird that way. So I have many times seen what the female birds are seeing in these other birds. So I've seen the birds glowing in this ultraviolet. So it's really fascinating topic. And I mean, researchers are studying all this stuff. So that's another interesting thing about these birds. Another interesting fact about birds, they're the only species that can be found on every single continents. I should say the only animal that can be found on every single continent. Every one. I mean, usually you hear, oh, that animal can be found on this, on every continent except Antarctica. But there are some species of birds that can be found in Antarctica. So the only bird species that can be found on every continent except Antarctica is the peregrine falcon. So there are, is no one bird species that can be found on every continent, but birds in general, they're the only animal that can be found on every continent. I always found that pretty interesting. So the fastest bird on Earth is the peregrine falcon. They can actually dive at speeds over 200 miles an hour. Now that's fast. Um, they're actually built for that speed. So, I mean, these birds, just amazing animals. Now, they do group in the winter time, and not just in the winter. I mean, a lot of birds group all the time. 
But when you see them flying overhead, and I see them a lot this time of year, like the chickadees, um, I was seeing a lot of them grouping together. Yeah, and my grapevines over here, I'm seeing a whole bunch of chickadees right now. And they group together for a couple of reasons. First of all, in the winter time, it's for warmth. Um, you start snuggling together, you stay warmer. It's also for protection. It's also, if you're talking about some of these birds that migrate south for the winter, which a lot of birds do, certain bird species like geese, they fly in the V formation, and that's actually to help them conserve energy. So that's another reason to fly in a group, not just for protection, but also for conserving energy. That guy in the front, as he starts to get tired from all the wind drag, he works his way towards the back. So the next goose will come to the front and that goose will now take on most of the wind that's coming right at them. And everyone else is in that V shape because they're catching the draft off of that front bird. So these are some of the reasons why birds group together. And I always see them grouping together in the winter time, even the solitary ones, the ones that don't usually hang out together. You'll see them a lot hanging out together in the winter for warmth and protection. Hard to hide in trees if they don't have leaves on them. So they're staying in those groups for protection. If you look like a big group, hmm, those bigger birds aren't going to bother you. At least we hope so. Now, communication with birds. You know, once again, same thing with the mating, color and sounds. Birds have a lot of different sounds. Uh, right now, the chickadees are doing their chickadee-dee-dee, chickadee-dee-dee. But in the springtime, I hear them doing their <whistles> which is a mating call. So you get different calls for different occasions. Um, so they have an actual communication system. Now, a couple of other interesting facts about birds is there's 50, 50 species of sparrows in North America. Yeah, I think you've um, had trouble identifying birds. Try identifying sparrows. You know, sparrows, male and female, look pretty much the same, um, even when you've got them in your hands because you're bird banding. Sometimes you have to do a lot of investigation just to figure out if it's male or female. A lot of times um, we end up writing down unknown. Yeah, we don't know male or female. But it's also sometimes difficult to determine what type of sparrow you're holding in your hand. Fortunately, we don't have a lot of species right in my area, but across all of North America, there's 50 different sparrow species. So birds are fascinating creatures. I really encourage you, get out this weekend, uh, watch the birds, listen to the birds, start exploring them, become a citizen science, um, record your data, and they will get it to the researchers, the scientists that are using that data. And if you need to, maybe you're not a great birder and you need to join someone or you need some more information on oh, what bird is that at my bird field. If you go to the birdcount.org site or go to audubon.org, um, also Cornell's website, all of these places have great bird ID information. There's also a course that you can take um, on the bird uh, Great Backyard Bird Count website, there's a course that you can take to learn how to identify birds. Cornell has a course too. I don't know if it's the same course, but uh, also use your eBird. Uh, you can also use Merlin and they will tell you what birds you're seeing or hearing. So great ways of doing this. I'm actually going to check my Merlin app right now. And... Let's see, caught me a dark-eyed junco, American crow, black-capped chickadee, yes, all of those. Um, blue jay, I did hear him a little bit earlier. And, oh, I didn't hear the white-breasted nuthatch. So all of these birds my Merlin app picked up. So I get to record those, and actually all this is going because I just stopped the recording, so I'm going to wrap up and head on in. But I just stopped the recording, so right now it's sending the data over to Cornell and they will put it in their database. 
So I'd like to thank you for joining me on my walk today. And once again, get out this weekend, grab some friends, grab your family, you know, just sit at your house or go to a nature center, go for a hike and start listening and watching the birds and start helping science with that. Uh, if you enjoyed what you heard, of course, invite your friends, rate and review the podcast. Um, I enjoy having you with me each week. So come on back, bring your friends with you. If you want to support the podcast, go to my Ko-Fi page. I have been putting a lot of extras on there for those who do support the podcast. Also helps keep the podcast going. Your support is greatly appreciated. I can't thank you enough for supporting um, the Nature Wanderer podcast. It also supports the other ventures of the Nature Wanderer. Uh, I'd also like to remind you about the Nature Wanderer Nature um, journals that are available on Amazon. All the links are in the show notes. If you're up for the challenge, you can always check out the Nature Wanderer challenge as well. Um, all the links for everything is right in the show notes. I'd like to thank you once again for joining me. And above all, keep exploring the nature around you. See you next week. Did you know that plastic is made with oil, a fossil fuel that pollutes the environment? And did you know that only about 15% of all plastic is recycled into new products? Wouldn't it be awesome if we could live our lives without plastic so that we could stop harming the planet? Well, there's a company that wants to help you do just that. Life Without Plastic sells products that will reduce or eliminate your dependence on plastic. They have a large selection from toothbrushes to food storage containers to drinking straws, all plastic-free. And it's reasonably priced. So what are you waiting for? Check out all these great plastic-free products and help save the planet. Just click on the link in the show notes to find out more and to start your journey to being plastic-free.